Hi, here we are in my continuing series of narrated PowerPoints for Earth Science students. My name is Brian Miller Hicks. So today we're going to talk about volcanoes. Volcanoes are pretty exciting. They are, of course, dangerous, hazardous, um, present eruption hazards, uh, earthquake hazards to a small to a smaller extent than other tectonic earthquakes, but Generally, they're considered dangerous. They may be thought of as pressure release valves for the pressure and heat that exists under the surface of the Earth. They have wide ranging effects. They can affect climate, weather. They can affect our soils uh, through their deposits. Um, so we know they're dangerous, but as we'll see, uh, later in this presentation, they can be beneficial as well. Now here is a depiction, a graphic of a historical famous eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, um, either August or October 79 AD. Um, some scholars, some geologists are not quite sure of the month. But this, as you know, is famous for bearing literally the cities of Herculaneum and the city of Pompeii underneath blankets of ash, rock, and tephra, which is a general name for particulates emitted by a volcano, and killed many thousands of people within a short period of time. Um, the uh, major burial of the population was by pyroclastic flow, which is a very, very rapid, very hot um, avalanche of volcanic debris, which can spread out over many, many miles, square miles, and in this case, bury the towns a number of feet deep. We are, we know the history of the eruption by actually having dug through these deposits and have found the remains or the, the um, fossilized remains in a way of people and animals that were buried by this catastrophic event. Okay, so as geologists, we know there are different types of eruptions and different types of volcanoes. The eruption and the type of volcano is controlled by the volume of magma, that means the amount of underground molten rock underneath a volcano location or a potential volcano location. The viscosity of the magma. Now viscosity is a measure of the liquidity of a material or substance. So a very viscous substance would be very thick and slow flowing. Um, an example of a viscous material that we're all familiar with might be tar, hot tar, or honey, um, something of that nature, thick and flowing slowly. The opposite would be a material with low viscosity, such as water, that has very low viscosity, flows very readily. Um, and um, another example might be uh, might be blood, not to get too graphic, but that's highly liquid and flows readily. The third factor that it controls an eruption or volcano type would be volatile content. A volatile is primarily a gas. Many eruptions contain a huge volume of gas, gas like carbon dioxide and water vapor mainly. So the more gas you have in there, the actually more explosive an eruption would be. And finally, the chemical composition of a magma controls the eruption of volcanic type. So let's look at the types of volcanoes that we're familiar with, the first being a composite or a stratovolcano. Stratovolcano 
you might recognize the word stratum or um, strata within that word. It means layered. So a stratovolcano is a volcano that's made up of more or less alternating layers of lava and ash and other fragmentary material, pyroclastic material. It's also known as composite because it is composed of different types of layered material like I've just described. Stratovolcanoes are the more dangerous types of volcanoes. Why? Because they contain more silica. Remember when I was talking about igneous rocks, the more silica you have, the more traffic jams you have, the more clustering of silica tetrahedra there are, the thicker the magma or the lava gets. So it's got higher viscosity. So the higher viscosity, more silica, less fluid material tends to build up higher gas pressures because the gas gets trapped in this viscous material. The lava flows are thick and slow moving. So with the high gas pressures that are built up, these volcanoes have the tendency to be more explosive. So high silica, high viscosity, high gas pressure, high explosiveness. For example, Mount St. Helens, which erupted explosively in 1980, May 18th. Vesuvius, which we've talked about already. The types of lavas these types of stratovolcanoes or composite volcanoes emit include andesite, rhyolite, and dacite. These are intermediate felsic rocks with, again, high silica and um, high viscosity. The other type of volcano is a shield volcano. The shield volcano has lavas and magma that have less silica. Because there's less silica, the lavas and the magmas have lower viscosity, the gas gets away more easily from this more liquid material. So these volcanoes are less explosive and the flows are more fluid. For example, Hawaiian volcanoes typically will erupt the, uh, a basalt type lava, okay? So let's take a closer look at eruptive products or materials that are erupted from an active volcano. Here is, of course, lava. Most people are familiar with how Hawaiian lava looks. This is indeed on the island of Hawaii. This is a lava flow, and it's primarily composed of basalt. And this strange word, which is a Hawaiian word, pronounced pahoe hoi, has to do with the texture of the, the flow itself. Pahoe hoi means flowing, um, readily flowing, not very viscous, and it tends to flow like a river when it's hot, and when it cools, it tends to cool into a, a black, charred-looking uh, basalt with pressure ridges that give us, again, an indication of the flowing texture or the flowing action of this lava flow. Again, the hottest parts of the lava flow are these bright yellow parts here. Then a little bit cooler are the orange parts, and still cooler are the black, dark, ropey um, strands or ridges of cooling, crusting lava. The other type of basaltic lava flow that you would see in Hawaii is called a'a. A'a lava is really crusty and clinkery, and it's formed by an active lava flow cooling at the top and the bottom. Here at the bottom, it's cooling faster because it's flowing over a cooler surface. Here at the top, it's cooling more rapidly because it's exposed to the cooler air. The interior remains somewhat hotter. So that means the lava flow still advances, 
but as it advances, the cooling material, the top and bottom, start to break up into fragments that we call uh -uh. Um, some geologists might joke that uh -uh is a sound you make if you're trying to walk over this very sharp fragmented lava flow surface after it's cooled of course okay these guys are outpacing the lava flow which is moving possibly three to five miles an hour or two to three miles an hour so you can run or you can walk three to four miles an hour you can run up to 10 to 15 miles an hour of course as we know usain bolt can run more than 20 miles an hour this is a depiction of lava being extruded under water under the sea again this is the hawaiian islands so often lava will flow from the land into the ocean and as it does so as you might imagine it cools pretty rapidly and it cools as as the lava flows into the water the outside of the lava cools more quickly but the interior remains hot so you have sort of a glassy crust and the stuff inside is more um, uh, pasty like as it remains hot but still starting to cool so it forms these pillow like shapes these grooves in the pillow like shapes could be considered stretch marks as the the um, pillow is moving sort of somewhat pastily in the ocean floor and what you end up with is a pillow shape with a glassy rind because the exterior cools rapidly with a pastier finer grain interior here's a sort of a composite picture of a volcano and its types of eruption products so tephra is a general name for fragmented material that comes out of a volcano whether it's ash or small fragments of rock or even big fragments of rock that we call bombs or boulders so here's the the magma coming through the central conduit or pipe of the volcano it erupts out of the summit vent crater erupts into an eruption column the, sending material sometimes tens of thousands of feet into the atmosphere the tephra plume up here th this would be the finer fragments up near the top would be the heavier fragments down near the bottom and you see here uh, wind blowing this tephra plume the finer fragments primarily are ash then down near the uh, crater itself the heavier fragments will fall out as ballistic debris meaning rocks and boulders out of this tephra plume or tephra cloud fine ash falls back towards the earth's surface piles up at the flanks of the volcano sometimes many miles from the volcano as a layered tephra deposit composed of ash fine fragments fragments of rock and sometimes fairly sizable pieces of rock um, the smaller fragments of rock are sometimes called lapilli l-a-p-i-l-l-i and often if you cut through these deposits you'll see the layers as um, as they're piling up sometimes these deposits are very hot still retain a lot of heat from the eruption and the heat within will cause some of these fragments to actually weld together and form quite a very very hard um, pyroclastic layer that we call in a nimbrite i-g-n-i-m-b-r-i-t-e okay here's a representation of some of the stuff that comes out of a volcano 
since this is throwing rock and fragments out of the vent as a fountain-like structure. It's called a fountain eruption. This is a photo of a volcanic bomb about 12 inches or so in length that's thrown out of the volcano at Kilauea. This is kind of scary looking. This is a tephra cloud or a tephra plume coming from the active volcano Mount Pele on the island of Mount Montserrat in the Caribbean. So you can see how scary and dense looking this cloud is. It's got trillions of particles of ash and other fragmentary material that's been erupted from the volcano. And it's blowing out to sea on the prevailing winds. This is a layered tephra deposit, as I mentioned. You can see here the different layers. Um, as you cut through the deposit, you expose the layered uh, nature of the deposit. This, these light colored layers, like you see here, in here and here are primarily ash layers, very fine particles of volcanic glass. Okay, they've piled up over time, this being the oldest, this being the youngest. Now the good thing about these ash layers is that you can take little samples of these ash layers and run them through, um, th run them through um, processes that tell us, tell geologists how old these layers are. Certain chemicals within these layers of ash can give us an age. So these are very handy, what we call marker horizons. Let's say this is 10 million years old. Let's say this is 5 million years old. That means everything in between is, is less than 10, but older than 5. Okay, so it's a very uh, useful um, layers to be able to spot in a overall tephra deposit. You notice that in the upper layers here, this is starting to turn into soil uh, because of organic activity near the surface. So we can call this a volcanic soil derived from a volcanic deposit. Let's take a look at types of volcanoes again more closely. Here's a depiction of a shield volcano up here, a stratovolcano or composite down here, and a cinder cone here. Shield volcano, like I've already mentioned, is composed of lavas with low viscosity, low explosivity, and primarily basalt composition. So its shape is low in profile and uh, very broad. That comes from the fact that the lava has low viscosity. So when it comes out, it spreads out like more like a thin syrup or perhaps a liquidy liquid ketchup mixed with water or something like that. So it's called a shield volcano because in profile it kind of looks like a soldier's, perhaps a Roman or a Greek shield laying on its flat side with the hump side facing up. Okay. Now shield volcanoes on this planet and our planet Earth are the biggest volcanic structures on the planet. The um, main volcano in Hawaii, Mauna Loa, is actually the tallest mountain on the planet if you consider the amount of volcano up above sea level, about 10,000 feet, and the amount of volcano below sea level down to the sea floor. You get that aggregate elevation from sea floor to the top, that's actually taller than Everest. <laughs> Okay, let's go to a stratovolcano or composite. In profile, this is the typical picture of a volcano that you might see a elementary student draw for you. It's got steep sides. It's got a flat top with a crater in it. So this would be 
that's the profile for Mount Rainier, Washington. It's got steeper sides because, of course, the lava is more viscous, more pasty, and thicker, so it tends to stand up on a steeper slope. And over here, the cinder cone is a volcanic structure that's composed primarily of loose fragmentary material, ash, uh, small rocks ejected from a vent with some explosivity, but not a lot. Uh, a lot of these cinder cones tend to be towards the basaltic composition side of things. If you go east to from San Diego, which is where I am, if you go east towards Arizona and into the Sunset Crater area, you can see a lot of these cinder cones. Uh, cinder cones tend to be small, 900, 1,000 feet in height, again with steep sides because of their uh, structure formed of piles of rock fragments, and they tend to be short-lived. In other words, a vent will erupt a cinder cone, build it up, and then quit or die out or move its activity elsewhere. This is again Mauna Loa, a Hawaiian type shield volcano. This is a photo of Mauna Loa, beautiful, beautiful mountain with actually snow on top. You, know, you might not think that Hawaii gets snow, but you get high enough in the atmosphere and cold enough and enough moisture, you get snowfall on the top of Mauna Loa. Here's a map of the Big Island Hawaii, and this is Mauna Loa here. It's a peak. Cross section of Mauna Loa, of course, you have the asthenosphere, a mantle plume, if you remember from our discussion of plate tectonics and igneous rock. The Hawaiian Islands were formed by having a persistent hot spot or mantle plume as the Pacific plate moved over this mantle plume, it up started popping islands that uh, have been forming over the last several million years. The oldest island, of course, is towards the northwest. Uh, that would be, I believe, um, uh, Kauai, if I'm not mistaken, and Hawaii, still sitting over the active hot spot, is the youngest. So here's where the molten rock comes up and through and up into the conduit of Mauna Loa, perhaps pausing and collecting in a shallower chamber, and it's still actively feeding the lava flows into some of them. Uh, some of the lava comes into what we call, the structure we call a caldera, which is sort of a basin or a lava lake, if you will. If you go up there to the top, you can see that. Here's a cinder cone. <clears throat> this is one of the craters in the Sunset Crater area that I talked about. As you can see, it's got steep sides, composed primarily of pyroclastic material or rock fragments. Here's the crater, central crater. Turns out that a lot of the lava that comes out of these cinder cones doesn't come out of the top, but it breaks through because cinder cone itself is fairly weak structure composed of the loose fragments. So lava can actually burst through the side or the bottom of the cinder cone itself. Strombolian refers to the type of eruption named after the island of Stromboli near Italy in the Mediterranean Ocean. Mediterranean Sea, excuse me. Here's a depiction of a composite cone or stratovolcano. As you can see by this exposed cross section, you've got layers of the light brown pyroclastic material and you have the darker layers of lava. So these are lava layers, the dark gray and these are pyroclastic layers, the sort of light grayish brown. Here's the central pipe or conduit of the volcano, also called the throat. Here's the summit crater. This is where lava and gas vent out of the volcanic structure. 
lava flows on the sides of the mountain. And here is something that we call a parasitic cone. What does that mean? Well, as you know, a parasite is an organism that lives on sometimes or within another organism, organism and takes nutrition or nutrients from that host organism and that's how it lives. You might consider a tick parasite because it latches onto you and sucks blood out of you. Many, many other examples of parasites of nature. So a parasitic cone is a smaller cone that grows on the side of a large volcano, taking some of the lava away from the main vent and building itself up on the side of the bigger host volcano, if you will. Mount St. Helens, beautiful, beautiful composite stratovolcano. This is a photo of Mount St. Helens taken before May 1980. It's one of the volcanoes in the Cascade Mountain chain of volcanoes in Washington, Oregon, or in actually Southern Canada, Washington, Oregon, and California. Then, this is Mount St. Helens um, erupting uh, after the occurrence of the landslide in May 1980. Here's the failure occurring as the whole north side of the mountain basically slid down and out. And here's the gas and steam and ash and the rock fragments being released from the pressure release caused by the occurrence of the landslide. 18, 1980, this beautiful volcano erupted. This is the north side of Mount St. Helens. The major eruption was actually what we call a lateral blast because this, in March of 1980, activity resumed in Mount St. Helens, signaled by a series of earthquakes. And there was a buildup of magma within the cone itself, the north side of the mountain started to bulge out. A fairly large volcano, uh, excuse me, a fairly large earthquake, 5.5, .5, occurred on May 18, 1980, about 8.30 in the morning. That caused the north bulging side of the volcano to actually fail or collapse a large landslide ejecting huge amounts of very hot gas, fragments, ash, and rock material out of this north side and blasting a large area in front called the blast zone, covering huge areas before it with rock fragments, ash, pyroclastic flows, um, killing, stripping trees off the forested slopes, launching, piling many, many trees and logs into a lake in front of it. It's called Spirit Lake. So this patch of gray here that you see is actually millions, thousands or maybe millions of logs and dead trees. Plinium is a type of eruption which is very, very violent. So it involves viscous lava, a lot of gas pressure, um, a volatile eruption named after a a uh, Roman gentleman named Pliny, who was actually killed in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. This is an aerial shot of the devastated area. Up the uh, north direction is in this direction, so up is north. Here's Spirit Lake with its patch of logs and timber and trees. This is the crater. This is um, mud flows, pyroclastic flow deposits. These ribbon-like areas you see here are actual rivers. And not only did this mountain send uh, landslide deposits and debris flows, pyroclastic flows, it also sent a lot of material down into these existing rivers choke these rivers, change the beds of the rivers, 
uh, got into the water of the rivers, raised the temperature of the river water to 98, 100 degrees Fahrenheit to where people would report fish jumping out of these rivers because the water was too hot. So this particular eruption, excuse me, um, caused quite a lot of damage to surrounding forests, to surrounding landscapes, to lakes and rivers, killed um, around 57 people, I believe, and caused quite a bit of economic damage to the area itself. So. We know about volcanoes and how dangerous they can be. What are some of the effects and some of the hazards? We know about lava flows. Okay, This is a depiction or photograph of a lava flow going through a city in Congo in the year 2002, uh, Mount Niragongo. And in fact, I believe fairly recently this year, there are more eruptions and more lava flows from this mountain in the Congo. Um, surprisingly, even though there is adequate warning for the populations around this volcano, this lava flow, as you can see, occupying a street between these buildings, has actually did actually kill some people. Uh, I'm not sure how that happened because you can usually escape from a even a uh, fairly moderately to fast flowing basaltic flow. Here's a uh, repeat of the first uh, graphic I showed you, Mount Vesuvius erupting over Pompeii and Herculane Herculaneum, stratovolcano, violent eruption with a lot of ash, a lot of gas, a lot of fragmentary, fragmentary material. Okay, so here's a depiction of some of the hazards from a typical stratovolcano eruption. As it erupts out the, the top summit vent, it sends lava flows down the sides. It um, sends bombs up in the air, sends huge amounts of gas, ash, and rock fragments up into the sky, up into the atmosphere, into an eruption cloud. Some material falls out of the eruption cloud as ash or an ash fall. Now, um, many eruptions contain hydrogen sulfide gas, carbon dioxide. These gases can combine with moisture in the atmosphere, and especially in the case of hydrogen sulfide, can combine to form sulfuric acid. So you have rain, which has a sulfuric acid composition raining down around the volcano. This is the most dangerous hazard that you'll find from a, uh, stratus, from a stratovolcano composite cone type eruption. This happens when you get huge amounts of fragmentary volcanic material, ash, and so forth, mixed with a very, very hot gas, 800, 1,000 degrees in uh, temperature. And these run down the mountain as huge, very fast moving landslides or um, avalanches, if you will, that we call pyroclastic flow. Pyroclasts are volcanic fragments flow, of course, you know what that means. And these are very dangerous because they move extremely rapidly. They can move 60 to 100 miles an hour. If you're trying to run away from one of these things, it's not going to happen. These things will overtake you, bury you, um, suffocate you, or burn you. So obviously, you want to avoid being in an area that's subject to these types of flows people in Pompeii and surrounding towns were not so lucky. Okay. Uh, these occur routinely in major eruptions um, from large dangerous volcanoes. A fumarole is just a vent that vents out gases at various times on an active volcano. Yeah. So 
This is a photograph of victims of the eruption. These are not actual people. You're not actually seeing bodies coated with ash. What you are seeing is as they as workers excavated through the layers of ash and rock above this level, they found cavities within the ash and rock deposits. They filled these cavities with plaster, plaster of Paris. And as they did so, these um, casts that were of plaster that were poured into the molds of the cavities revealed outlines of people and in a lot of cases um, animals as well, dogs, horses, cats. But it's a very stark reminder and depiction of some of the uh, terrible catastrophe that occurred to the human population, some of the agonies that people suffered as they were being buried and suffocated underneath the ash and the pumice and the rock fragments. This gentleman here was struggling to get up, struggling to breathe as he propped himself up in his elbow, only to fall victim eventually to the terrible devastation of the eruption. Here's a depiction of Mount Vesuvius from the air. Here's the central summit crater. Now, Mount Vesuvius is still an active volcano. This is the summit crater close up. So it still periodically sends steam and ash into the air. What would happen if we had an eruption from Mount Vesuvius about the same scale as 79 AD eruption? That would be horrendous because these patches you see surrounding the mountain are cities that have built back up around the flanks of Mount Vesuvius. Okay, This is not thousands of people. This is millions of people. So an eruption of that scale would be quite devastating to many thousands, if not a million people. Let's hope that doesn't happen, but it could. As I have mentioned, uh, volcanoes have atmospheric effects that can affect our weather and climate. Here's a uh, depiction of how that happens. So you get an eruption, you get gas, ash, water, um, hydrochloric acid in the atmosphere, acid rain, ashes falling, you get sulfur dioxide, which is a gas, you get uh, sulfuric acid with which forms particles that are actually reflecting sunlight that's what these arrows mean so a reflection of sunlight may have a long lasting or fairly long lasting effect of actually cooling the atmosphere this reflection of sunlight causes cool infrared or heat down here can be trapped by these clouds. So you get heating under the clouds and you might get cooling of the atmosphere as some um, sunlight is reflected. In fact, major eruptions like the 1815 eruption in Indonesia caused what is popularly known as the year without summer. There was so much cooling effect from particles being emitted into the atmosphere from this huge eruption that the summer that year was quite cool. Let's take a closer look at landforms and structure. This is a caldera. I've already mentioned that term. This is the beautiful Crater Lake caldera in Southern Oregon. I've been there. It's just tremendous. It's an amazing place. This happened when a volcano actually collapsed. Okay, th this was a large cascade volcano called Mount Mazama, and it had a series of eruptions that drained the magma chamber below so that the top structure of the volcano collapsed into 
the magma chamber below, um, producing or creating a cavity, which eventually filled up with rainwater, melting snow and ice, and groundwater. This little island here is called Wizard Island. There is still some volcanic activity after the collapse and the formation of the caldera, which produced this little cinder cone here. Here's a depiction of how that all happened. Mount Mazama was a large volcano, and it drained itself of lava in the upper part of the magma chamber. The whole volcano collapsed into this void, forming a caldera, which filled up with water. Now, this happened pretty recently. Didn't happen very long ago, some, only something like uh, 7,000 years ago. So there may well have been Native Americans which witnessed or at least heard this event or series of events. Here's another caldera, or actually this is a crater. It's considered a crater because it's not actually a collapse feature as much as it's a void caused by um, steady eruptions of gas and material out of the central summit vent. This is the Hale Mau Mau crater in Kilauea, and this is active lava. The black stuff, of course, is cooling, hardening lava. The red stuff is still super hot, um, exposed lava, cracking up the basaltic black crust that you see here. A rift eruption. So a rift means a crack or a fracture, and often that's how we see eruptions occurring in Hawaii. You have long linear fractures and you have lines of fountaining lava coming out of these fissures. You also see this kind of eruption in Iceland. As some of you may know, there's been a recent series of eruptions on the island of Iceland, which are coming out as fresh basaltic lava, some of them fissure eruptions. Now, if you have enough fissure eruptions in a wide enough area over a long, long enough amount of time, you can build up areas of terrain that we call flood basalts. So here's a depiction of a fracture with fresh material coming out of the fissure and spreading out on either side of the fissure as you know by now, fairly low viscosity, fairly liquid lava, basalt. So these spread out over large areas over long periods of time and have actually produced landscapes that we know of as flood basalt areas. Um, in our country, we have the Columbia River basalts, and we have other volcanic rocks occupying the Snake River Plain. The Columbia River basalts are quite famous because the Columbia River is actually cut through them, and you can see the exposed layers of basalts in the sides of the Columbia River Canyon or the Columbia River Gorge. Down in New Mexico, this is the volcanic neck of ship rock in the northeast corner of New Mexico. So there used to be a volcanic structure up and around this. This is actually solidified magma that filled up the volcanic neck or conduit or throat of the volcano. The volcanic structure is actually stripped away by erosion leaving only this very hard, resistant, uh, solidified magma in the center of the volcano. A dike is a structure that is left after erosion of material around a fissure um, that's filled up with lava as well. Here's a depiction of ship rock here in the center, and what we envision or visualize 
the volcano it might have looked like around the uh, around Shiprock in ancient times. Here's some more structures associated with volcanism. A pluton is a body of intrusive rock that has cooled from an intrusive magma below the surface of the earth and cooled into a rock. Many plutons are granitic because they get to sit underneath the surface of the earth and cool slowly and grow large crystals and become uh, um, granitic in composition. A dike is a um, a tabular body of magma that can cut across rock existing or pre-existing rock underneath and form it a uh, on a cross section it might look like a vein but it's actually a tabular body cross cutting through rock a sill is also an intrusive body that forms as it can is it injects magma between existing layers of rock so we'll take a look at all of these this is a dike this is magmatic material which forced its way vertically upward through surrounding rocks which have since been eroded or stripped away on both sides so as you can see, it's not just a vein, it's actually a wall or a tabular body. If you were to come across this in the wilderness in Arapaho National Forest, Colorado, and you were not a geologist, you might think this is actually a man-made wall, but it's not. It's a natural wall made of magma injecting itself forcibly through country rock and being exposed uh, solidifying into rock and being exposed by erosion. A sill, as I mentioned, is primarily a horizontal body. In this case, has injected magma in between the layers of sedimentary rock. You see these layers of sedimentary rock up here, okay, and the sill found its way between weak um, uh, contacts between layers of sedimentary rock and forced its way horizontally then cooled into this into this body of volcanic rock you see here here's another interesting structure basalt when it comes out as flows um, hot flows will cool over time and often if the flow is thick enough as it cools it contracts into structural columns that you see here these are columns of basalt now primarily it's black or dark in color and but down here why is it white or very light in color well simply it's crusted over with salt from seawater washing up and depositing salt on top of these lower basaltic columns. The whitish color up here may be partly salt and may be partly deposits of bird material, bird guano. Now let's talk about plutons. Plutons are bodies of intrusive rock, primarily granitic, but they're also called batholiths. Bath means deep and lith means rock. So we recognize that along the west coast of North America, we have many, many hundreds, if not thousands of miles of these rock bodies of intrusive rock, which formed and cooled underground and are now exposed by erosion. Here in California, we have the Southern California batholith farther north we have the Sierra Nevada batholith which we see today as a mighty mountain range the Sierra Nevada exposed by uplift and faulting and erosion 
This is the batholith a photograph of the Eastern Sierra Nevada mountain front. Okay, let's get to some basics about why rocks melt, what makes them melt, what promotes their melting. So, melting rocks. If you look at this graph, this chart, you have on this side, you have depth going from zero, which is the Earth's surface, down to 250 kilometers or 300 kilometers. Um, 300 kilometers is roughly 200 miles. This scale, you have temperature going from zero degrees centigrade to more than 2,000 degrees centigrade. And here you have a kind of bluish purple line, and you have an orange red line and a shaded in orange area. So what this shows, in this region, the light green region, we have solid rock. The conditions of temperature and pressure are that are such that rock within this temperature range from zero to 1600 degrees at this depth will remain solid rock at the Earth's surface from zero to about, um, let's say, a thousand degrees, the rock at the Earth's surface will remain solid. Now, why does Earth, I'm, I'm sorry, why does rock at a deeper depth take higher temperatures to melt? Well, simply, if a rock is at a deeper depth, it's under greater pressure from all the rock above it, which means all that rock pressing down, all that pressure pressing down on the rock at 300 kilometers means that it'll take a higher temperature to break those bonds apart and to start the rock melting. So that's why rock at depth will only melt melt at a higher temperature than rock near the Earth's surface. So the melting point here and the melting point here, this comprises the melting point curve. As you go deeper, 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 it takes more and more and more temperature to melt that rock. Okay. Now you have partial melting along the margin of this line as you go further to the right, at higher and higher temperatures, the rock melts completely. This purple blue line is called the geothermal gradient. This simply means that, let's say at zero depth, zero temperature, you have, um, you have a condition where rock won't melt at all. As you go deeper down into the earth, the temperature increases. So this is just a temperature curve. That's all this is showing. Okay, as you go to 100 kilometers down, the temperature below the surface of the earth is now at about 1300 degrees centigrade. And then as you go deeper yet, deeper, 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 the temperature continues to increase, but at a slower rate. Why is that? It's just that the temperature in the upper 100 kilometers of the Earth um, increases faster than the temperature in deeper parts of the Earth. Here we have a different graphic that shows some of the influence of water in melting. So let's look at this melting curve for dry basalt. At the Earth's surface, basalt will start melting at 1,000 degrees centigrade. As you go deeper, 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 it, the melting temperature of basalt increases steadily so that 30 kilometers down, it's greater than 1200 degrees centigrade. With granite, granite, as you know, 
as minerals that melt at a lower temperature than basalt does. So basalt has a lot of magnesium and iron, which melt at fairly high temperatures. Granite has much less magnesium and iron and more quartz and feldspar, which melt at lower temperatures. So the Earth's surface, the melting temperature is around 800 degrees. Then as you go deeper, it's at 30 kilometers, the melting temperature is 1,000 degrees. So far, so good. As you go deeper, the pressure gets higher, so it takes more heat to break apart those bonds which are being compressed and the rock is being subject to intense pressures the deeper you go. But let's add water to the granite. Okay, you add water to the granite, at the Earth's surface, temperature of the melting is the same. But as you go deeper, it actually takes less heat to melt granite at 30 kilometers down than it takes to melt granite near the surface. So at 30 kilometers down, the melting temperature of granite is maybe 620 degrees. That means that water acts as a catalyst or accelerant for melting. You add water to a hot rock, it's going to melt at a low temperature. This is important when we talk about conditions of melting and the formation of magma under certain conditions of temperature and pressure. So that brings us to volcanoes and plate tectonics. Volcanoes, as you already know, I hope from our discussion on plate tectonics, occur along tectonic plate boundaries. You see the red marks here on this map of the, of the Earth. This is where volcanoes occur. They don't occur haphazardly. They occur along tectonic plate boundaries. This is a subduction or convergent boundary. The same here. The same here. This is a convergent subduction boundary where you have an ocean plate diving underneath an ocean plate. So now you have a volcanic island arc, the Aleutian Islands. Over here, along the west coast of South America, you have subduction of an ocean plate subducting under a continental plate that's forming a continental volcanic arc, the Andean chain. Up here, same thing. You have subduction of ocean plate underneath the continental plate forming the Cascade Volcanoes. Now you also have volcanoes, of course, and it doesn't show up very well on this map. Uh, you have a volcano showing up above a hot spot in the Hawaiian Islands. You have volcanic, volcanic chain on the island of Iceland over, over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and a hot spot. Okay, so we know the conditions, tectonically speaking, that cause the formation of volcanoes and volcanic chains. Here's uh, going over this, and this might be a repeat of some of what we've already covered in plate tectonics. But here you have a subducting ocean lithosphere plate. Water is driven from the plate. Now when you have a subducting ocean plate, it's dragging wet mud, wet sediments, wet material plus water itself down with it. As you know from what I just told you, water is an accelerant or a catalyst to melting. So you add water to hot rock, at, that promotes melting. Mantle rock starts to melt, the molten rock is less dense, it rises, and it forms volcanic island arc on the sea floor. Okay, this is Mount Augustine, Alaska, which is part of the Aleutian volcanic island arc. You have a continental volcanic arc, same conditions. Wet material, a lot of water being subducted, promotes melting, formation of a continental volcanic arc. 
On the ocean ridges, we of course don't have converging plates, we have diverging plates. The diverging plates cause a low pressure zone to form at the ridge axis. Low pressure zone, a low pressure zone means we get a type of melting called decompression melting. So it's pretty simple to visualize. The less pressure you have, the easier it is for the rocks to start melting because that makes it easier to break the bonds of the minerals under high heat conditions and they start melting. So more water promotes melting, less pressure promotes melting. We have a um, scenario, tectonic scenario, where we have hotspot volcanism, or we have a rising mantle plume, feeding melting of the lithosphere, causing the formation or creation of flood basalts, for example, or in this case, a volcanic chain. Let's say this is the Hawaiian chain, where the hotspots underneath the active Hawaiian island. And meanwhile, these volcanoes have moved off the hotspot, so they're no longer active. Now, volcanoes, they're not all bad. There's some benefits of volcanoes. Well, how about soil? Rich, rich soils. Volcanic soils have a lot of nutrients. Volcanic soils contain sometimes a fair amount of volcanic glass, pumice, um, ash, which readily decomposes. Glass, because it's unstable with not much crystal structure, breaks down pretty easily under chemical and physical weathering, which gives us rich soils, which gives us great coffee, like we get in Costa Rica, which is a, an, a, a country which has lots of volcanoes and lots of volcanic soils. What about minerals? Let's focus on a particular mineral we call diamonds. Now, what are diamonds made of? They're made of carbon. Now, where does this carbon come from? The carbon comes from material that's collected at the bottom of the seafloor on the uh, seafloor ocean plate, which then becomes subducted to 100, 125 kilometers below a continent. Um, at those conditions of temperature and pressure, the carbon becomes transformed into diamonds. The diamonds deep below the surface of the Earth cannot actually make it to the surface of the Earth without some help. This help comes in the form of volcanoes with deep roots, which collect magma that contain diamonds. The diamonds then get erupted near the surf or at the surface of the earth, or get trapped within the throats of these special deep rooted volcanoes into a rock that we call kimberlite. Kimberlite is volcanic rock which contains diamonds. Kimberlite is because the, the volcanic um, rock is close to the Earth's surface, for example, in South Africa, we're able to mine it. How do we mine it? Well, we just dig a hole into that volcanic rock and start extracting diamonds. And finally, volcanoes, because they're in volcanically active areas, they can heat up groundwater and hot groundwater provides hot places for us to soak our tired, weary bodies in. This is a photo of macaque monkeys in northern Japan, which are taking advantage of that hot spring activity and soaking their poor, tired bodies in this very, very beneficial hot water, which they appear to really like. Now, if I were a human tourist, I'd probably stay away from trying to get into this hot water with them. Don't know what's going to happen. 